All right, we're going to talk this morning about the coming Exodus. There was an Exodus in the past, a whole book of the Bible named after it, but there's another one coming. And uh, I thought it'd be appropriate here to start out explaining a few things because of all the conflict in the Middle East right now. And there's a lot of talk, these, these wicked Arabic countries talking about rising up against Israel. And there's a lot of wicked people out there saying that, you know, how dare the Jews fight for their land over there. They, they seem to think that, that it's wrong and, you know, whatever. I'm going to show you why it is not wrong. We're going to start out in Genesis 17, verses 1 through 8. Okay, it says here, And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me, and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations out of the, or nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant. It doesn't go away. It's everlasting. And to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give thee or give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Okay, when God establishes a covenant and then he says it's everlasting, that's not something that goes away. And God's word, he's the one that created this earth, and he gets to say who owns parts of it. And God promised that land over there of Israel, and it's a lot bigger than what they currently control, I might add, but God promised that to the Jewish people. And it's an everlasting covenant. It's not something that's going away. So when you hear the United Nations or CNN or anybody say that the Jews are wrong for fighting for the Gaza Strip or, you know, for this or that, they don't know what they're talking about. And what they're doing is they're rebelling against the word of God. That's what's going on there. The Jews have a right to that land, and they're going to get it, by the way. Okay? Turn back to Romans chapter 11. Another thing that you're going to hear is, well, yeah, the Jews did have that promise to them, but because they rejected Jesus as their Messiah, now the promises have passed from Israel and now they're on the Gentiles, on the church. That's another wicked heresy that you're going to hear today. And it's nonsense. Romans chapter 11, verse 1. And this is after you know the, the book of Acts there. They start out preaching to the Jews. And then as the Jews start to reject as a nation, there were Jews that were getting saved the whole way through the book of Acts. But as the Jews rejected as a nation, the promises began and the, the gospel started to be taken to the Gentiles. Okay, and Paul called himself the apostle of the Gentiles. But look what he says here in Romans chapter 11, verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Now that's not talking about spiritual you know, being a spiritual Jew. He's saying it's according to the flesh. Okay? God hasn't cast away the Jewish people. Jump down to verse 25. Romans 11, verse 25. It says here, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye, be, ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Okay, the covenant's there. It's still there. Now the Jews nationally have rejected Jesus Christ. Does that mean that none of them can get saved? No. You can still have individual Jews getting saved, but right now as a nation... And it's usually the people in control are the ones that, that keep the gospel out. I think the average Jew on the street in Israel probably would be open to hearing the gospel. 
But just as it was in the first century, they oftentimes feared the leaders. They feared the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees and the scribes. They feared them. They didn't want to be put out of the synagogue. Probably the same situation today. But eventually, the whole nation is going to accept Jesus as their Messiah. Okay, and, and it's been covered in other studies, so we can't get into it. But look at verse 28 there. It says, As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. So, right now, if you go over to Israel and you try to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ on a street corner or something, <laughs> you're not going to be well received. You, you know, especially if the leaders of the synagogues are there and they, you know, the rabbis and things, they're not going to like you very much. And a Jew that gets saved now, they have a rough time with their family. I mean, a very rough time. You know, it's, it means a, a lot to be saved as a Jew today. But eventually they will be brought back. Okay, and that's when the Lord returns. But one other thing I want to point here, point out here before we continue. Verse 25, it says, Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now, right now, God is no respecter of persons. God will deal with anybody. Doesn't matter what race you are, doesn't matter what background you have, God will deal with anybody. But the time's coming very soon when the church age ends. The time of the Gentiles, I think, you know, you could debate this, but I think the times of the Gentiles still kind of continues till the end of the tribulation because Gentiles can be saved, I think, during that time period. But God is starting to deal nationally now with one nation. And he... It's the time of Jacob's trouble. He rebukes the Jews at that time period, that, that nation, but it's to bring them back into line. And by the time you hit the millennial kingdom, God is now national. He's now dealing with the nation of Israel. And Jerusalem becomes the city of the great king. Jesus rules physically from there. So you see things that happen in the Old Testament, which we're going to be covering today, where God is hardening the heart of Pharaoh. And you say, well, why would God do that? Well, it's to show his glory, okay? And God, in this coming time period, this great tribulation, there's going to be a lot of hardened hearts as well. You'll see that all through the book of Revelation, that they didn't repent. They get judged, and they don't repent. They just continue in their wickedness. And God pours out his wrath on the nations of this world. Right now, God has been very good to the Gentile nations. But in the tribulation... He's going to be, you know, slaughtering them right and left. Okay, one other place to turn to quick before we get into the main study. Hosea chapter 11. Back in your in the uh, minor prophets. <clears throat> Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. <clears throat> I want to touch on something else here with this verse. It says, When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Now, we're going to be talking about that, that book of Exodus, how God used Moses. He raised up Moses and Aaron to bring the Jews out of Egypt. Now, if you study the Bible, you'll see different times where Egypt is kind of likened to the world. It's a type of the world. Okay, and there's, you know, you can do a lot of good messages on that as far as, you know, we're kind of called out of Egypt and, you know, you can make a lot of reference there. The things that are written aforetime are written for our learning. Okay, there's a lot of, of application there. But let's, let's look at the actual events there that happened in the book of Exodus. So turn back to the book of Exodus. Genesis, Exodus, chapter 2, I guess is where we're going to start out at. Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. And you're going to see that uh, history is going to repeat itself. Now, the events in the book of Exodus aren't identical to what's coming in the time of Jacob's trouble, but there are a lot of similarities, a lot of neat things that you can compare the two events. Okay, because, you know, Jerusalem, the Jews back then were in bondage to Egypt, the country, but now they're in bondage to the world, Egypt being a type of the world. Let's continue here. Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 says, And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died, 
And the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Now, God didn't make three different covenants there. It's He made it with Abraham and his seed. Okay, that's what's going on there in verse 24. Verse 25, And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, you can keep your hand there in, in Exodus, because we're going to be back there a lot. But I just want to look at a few verses here in Jeremiah. I've been referring to the time of Jacob's trouble. And it's important to tie these scriptures together. Jeremiah chapter 30. <clears throat> Jeremiah 30 verse 4 is where we're going to start out. Okay, it says here in Jeremiah 30 verse 4, And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. This is not spiritual Jews that he's speaking to. For thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the day, even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Uh, for it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Okay, that will be at the end when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to rule as their king. Verse 10, Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity, and Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations whither I have scattered thee, Yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Has that happened yet? No. <laughs> there are plenty of other nations out there. Okay? But the Lord's going to make a full end of all those nations at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble going into the millennial kingdom. So go back to Exodus. Now, it's interesting there, they were talking about that they were having trouble and their cries came up to the Lord. It's going to happen again in this coming time period. Many people call it the Great Tribulation. But now look at Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. It says here, And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this, to and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Now that's very interesting because you see there are two witnesses that come in Revelation chapter 11. You can read about that. We're not going to turn there. Um, but these two witnesses, and I've talked about this in other studies, so I'm not going to cover it here. I believe that they are Moses and Elijah. There's a lot of reasons I believe that. But it's interesting because Revelation 11 verse 8 says, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Jerusalem in the time of Jacob's trouble is going to be, the Antichrist is going to be there. You know, He's going to sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Another part in scripture there. But it's called spiritually Sodom and Egypt. So, very interesting thing there. You know, the, the children of Israel back here in Exodus are in bondage to Egypt, and in the future they will also be in bondage to Egypt. Different type of Egypt, though. It's spiritual, spiritually called Egypt. And at some point in time, too, by the way, they're going to have to flee Jerusalem. We'll get into that a little bit later. Turn over to Exodus chapter 4, verse 21. 
says here, And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand, but I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Okay, very interesting there. And again, Pharaoh, I believe, is a type of the Antichrist. Some interesting parallels there between Pharaoh and the Antichrist. And Moses is going to do signs and wonders before him. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Now turn over to chapter 7. Exodus chapter 7, verse 1. Okay, it says here, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Uh, it's an interesting scripture there. He made Moses a god to Pharaoh. Does that mean that, that Moses is now a god? No. It just means that to a pagan like Pharaoh, he's seeing all this these signs that Moses is doing, and those types of people would consider him to be a god. You know, if you remember in the book of Acts, there's a, a point in time where Paul is getting sticks and to place them on the fire, and a snake bites his hand, and the, the heathen people are looking at him and they're they're saying, "Well, he's not dead." And what do they say? Well, he's not a man. He must be a god. That's what people think when they see a supernatural thing connected with a, a man. Okay, so it doesn't mean Moses was the you know God made him into a, another god. Uh, verse 2, Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of his land, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. Uh, one more verse here. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. Okay, very interesting there. Um, why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Well, so, the G, so, the, so that the Jews could see the power of God. I mean, think about this in the future. How would it be if Jesus just came back and peaceably walked into the United Nations and said, Hi, I'm Jesus Christ. I'm here to uh, take over the city of Israel. Um, you're going to sign this treaty here. Thank you. Okay. There you go. Would the Jews really accept him as their Messiah? No. But after seven years of signs and wonders that can't be explained scientifically, <laughs> you know, seven years of God's wrath being poured out on this earth, the Jews are going to be ready and willing to accept Jesus as their Messiah. And with Moses and Elijah preaching to them too. That's what was going on here. If Moses just would have walked in and said, Hey, Pharaoh, I'd like to take the Jews out. You know, come on. And, oh, okay, go ahead. See ya. There really wouldn't have been much cause for them to believe in God. But that's not what the Lord did. The Lord used a heathen man and actually hardened his heart so that he could perform miracles before the Jews and confirm his power and his word to those Jewish people. Okay? Very interesting. And notice there in verse 4 it says, and bring forth mine armies. That's also very interesting. The Jews didn't come out as kind of a poor, weak people. You read through the book of Exodus there, and we're not going to cover it today, but they actually borrowed riches from the Egyptians. And God said, okay, now leave. <laughs> so they spoiled the Egyptians. It's kind of interesting. And they came out as an army. You know, also very interesting. And in the future, you know, here you have the Jews, the armies coming out of Egypt. But in the future, Jesus comes back with armies. We're not going to turn there. I'll just read this quick. Revelation 19, verse 11 through 14 says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. 
and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So uh, that's going to be you if you're saved. You're going to be part of that army. Okay, so very interesting stuff there. Now jump down to verse 10 there in Exodus chapter 7. It says here, And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Now look at this, verse 11. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, uh, now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. Did you know Satan's ministers can mimic some of the miracles that God does? Yeah, absolutely. But look at the rest of the verse. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. <laughs> Even though they can mimic the miracles of God, God's miracles are still stronger. They're the real thing. Uh, verse 13, And he hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened, he refuseth to let the people go. That wasn't enough signs for him. Jump down to verse 20. It says here, And Moses and Aaron did so, as the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod and smote the waters that were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, and all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. Hmm, interesting. And the fish that was in the river died. Well, we don't see that going on today, do we? Um, and the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river, and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, neither did he hearken unto them, as the Lord had said. It's interesting because Revelation 8, 8, chapter 8, verse 8 says, And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. So it happened back there in Exodus, and it's going to happen again. Uh, verse 9 says there in Revelation 8, And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Then later in Revelation 16 it says, Verses 4 through 6, And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be, because thou hast judged us. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Isn't that interesting? It happened back there in Exodus, and it's going to happen again. And the interesting thing is, Moses is going to be there during that time period, I believe. You know, very interesting. Now turn over to Exodus chapter 8. Exodus chapter 8, verse 5. And I'm skipping over a lot of things. I mean, you really ought to read the whole book of Exodus here, where the Lord's actually telling them to go do this and to go do that. I'm skipping a lot of it here for sake of time. But uh, Exodus chapter 8, verse 5, And the Lord spake unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. So, so far the miracles that had been performed by Moses and Aaron, these magicians were able to mimic the same thing. We're going to see about how long that continues here in just a little bit. But uh, let's continue on here. Verse 8. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. Oh, wow, he's repenting. Verse 9, And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me, when shall I entreat for thee and for thy servants and for thy people to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses, that they may remain in the river only? Okay, things are pretty bad right now. And he says, Pharaoh's saying, Please, entreat the Lord. I'm wrong. You know, 
get these frogs out of here. This is horrible. You know, slimy frogs all over the place, croaking and things. It's, it's bad news. You know, and and treat the Lord. Get these things out of here. And Moses says, well, that's great. Glory to God, you know. When do you want them out of here? Now, what would be the normal reaction to that? Wouldn't it be to right now, you know? But look at Pharaoh's reply. And he said, verse 10, and he said, tomorrow. And he said, be it according to thy word, that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. That's a very significant thing there. And I heard a couple times references. I know uh, uh, Dr. Hugh Pyle had a little booklet I saw the one time, and it was called One More Night with the Frogs. And I never understood, you know, I thought, I was thinking maybe it was the, the spirits of the devils back in Revelation that, you know, that appears frogs and things. And I couldn't figure out what this thing was about. It was always one of them things. I should probably get that and read it, but, you know. And I heard uh, Dr. Ruckman refer to it. I heard a couple people refer to this One More Night with the Frogs thing. Finally, I heard a preacher preach on that thing there, and it's, ah, okay, I get it. You see, it's a great picture of a lot of lost men out there. What you have is they have a problem. They have something that they realize, hey, this is a problem. They call out to the Lord and they say, I have a problem here. A lot of men, they'll get cancer or they'll get some kind of a thing or they get really sick, and they say, God, if you heal me from this, you know, I'll, I'll serve you and everything. And the preacher comes along and he says, okay, you need to get saved. You need to get saved. Call on the Lord right now. Now's the day of salvation. And the wicked man says, well, maybe tomorrow. How about tomorrow? Just give me one more night with the frogs. <laughs> you know, one more night with my buddies at the bar. One more night with my relatives at the Catholic Church. Just just tomorrow. I, I can't right now. You know, just one more night with the frogs. And uh, what happens is, jump down to verse 15 there. Exodus chapter 8, verse 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Hmm. And there's a lot of guys that are like that. You know, that there's some horrible thing. They cry out to the Lord. I, I want to get saved. I, I, I'll give you my life. Well, how about now? Well, I'm not ready yet. And all of a sudden, this horrible thing goes away, and now they don't need the Lord anymore. Yep. They had their one more night with the frogs, and now things are better, and now they don't need the Lord. A lot of people are like that. Uh, it's interesting. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 and 8 says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Now that's talking specifically about the Jews, how they harden their hearts. But I think it applies right here too. And it applies to lost men rejecting Jesus Christ, saying, no, I'm not ready yet. Just one more night. So that's, I mean, I, I realize that a lot of these sermons go to saved people, but I'm conscious of the fact too that there are lost people listening. And... I'm going to talk a little bit more about salvation later, but don't be tempted to, to spend one more night with the frogs, okay? It's not worth it. Going to the bars and all your buddies and all that other stuff, drop it. Get saved. Okay, it's just, it is not worth it. Okay, look at verse 16. Exodus 8, 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so, for Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice in man and in beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. All the dust became lice? That'd be bad. Verse 18 and the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. Hmm. There's a limit to what these guys can do with their enchantments. They, they, they've been imitating all the things that Moses and Aaron could do. Now all of a sudden, the Lord says, hey, that's enough. This one you aren't going to be able to copy. Uh, verse 18 here, we'll finish up. So there was... So there were lice upon man and upon beast. Then the magicians said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. 
And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. We can't imitate this one, Pharaoh. What are we going to do? <laughs> These Jews are making us look bad. Yep, that's right. Turn over to chapter 9. We'll go to verse 11. Exodus 9, 11. And here again, the magicians pretty much have lost their ability to uh, imitate the Lord's miracles here. It says here, And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boil was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. It's interesting, too. I'm not going to go there, uh, but it's in Revelation. It talks about those that have the mark of the beast. They actually get a boil at some point in time. You know? Interesting there. Another tie-in. Verse 12, and the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning, and stand before Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth." Is that going to happen again? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's definitely coming. Um, continuing here. For now I will stretch out my hand and I that I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence, and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. And in very deed, for this cause have I raised thee up for to show in thee my power and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. Very interesting. For this cause have I raised thee up. God raised up Pharaoh. I'll give you a modern day equivalent. God raised up Obama. Why? Because this nation deserves Obama. So I think God's judgment's going to come on this on on America. It's already here. You know? We're already going through it. It's already there. Why did Germany get Hitler? Well, study the condition of Germany morally at that time. They got Hitler because they deserved him. You know, a nation's ruler is evidence of what the people are like. Okay, there's a, a great saying, as goes the church, so goes the nation. All right. Judgment begins at the house of God. I want to go off on another subject. Turn over to. OK, I'll wait a second here. Uh, yeah. All right. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 11 now. I'm going to look at a little bit here at some of the things that, that uh, Moses and Elijah are doing in the time of Jacob's trouble. Revelation chapter 11, verse 4. It says here, These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies, and if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood. Just like he did back in the book of Exodus. And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Hmm. Sounds like he's going to be doing a lot of the same things that he did back there in the book of Exodus. Why? Why? To bring God glory and to prove to the Jews that he is Moses. Isn't that going to be interesting for Orthodox Jews living in Jerusalem? Here's this guy shows up and he's preaching Jesus Christ. And yet he says, I'm Moses. Oh, you don't believe me? Check this out. Remember back in the book of Exodus? Turning your Bible to the book of Exodus, you know. And he says, okay, boom. River becomes blood. All you that Still not convinced? Okay, here. Frogs come up out. Going to smite the earth with all plagues. Very, very interesting. Now turn over to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. Something else very interesting here. It says here, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast which whose deadly wound was healed. 
And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by his sword and did live. Very interesting. So you're going to have Moses and Elijah performing miracles, and the false prophet is also going to be mimicking those things. Just like in the book of Exodus. Same thing exactly. Very interesting stuff. Okay, turn back to the book of Exodus. should have told you to keep your hand there, but Exodus chapter 9. We'll go there. Exodus 9, verse 22. Now, you remember what the false prophet did? He was calling down fire. Look at what happens here in Exodus 9, 22. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thine hand toward heaven, that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, upon man and upon beast and upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire ran along upon the ground, and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. Very interesting. Hail mingled with fire. And you'll see both things in that tribulation time period. There's hail, great hail stones. You know, I think, doesn't it say about the weight of a talent, I think? And, you know, there's fire also coming down from heaven. So again, you see another... Uh, comparison there. Jump down to verse 27 in Exodus chapter 9. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous and I and my people are wicked. Entreat the Lord for it is enough that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail and I will let you go and ye shall uh, stay no longer. You say, oh, well, that's great. Isn't that wonderful? He repented. Well, look at... Uh, Verse 34, And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart, he and his servants, and the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, neither would he let the children of Israel go, as the Lord had spoken by Moses. Harden his heart again. And how many times have there been rough things that have happened here in America, even now, we're not even in the time of Jacob's trouble yet, but even now, things are bad, they happen, and people go, oh, i got to get right with God, and, oh, and then it levels off, and they get right back to their old ways. Look at uh, chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these my signs before him, and that thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son and of thy son's son, what things I have wrought in Egypt, and my signs which I have done among them, that ye may know how that I am the Lord. God is proving his power. And it's interesting because these same things, these same stories, if you would go up to an Orthodox Jew, they'd know all about it. They would know about it. Very interesting. They're still telling their sons and their sons' sons about the stories of Exodus. Uh, very interesting stuff. Look at verse 21. Chapter 10, verse 21. Here we see another one that is very interesting. Exodus chapter 10, verse 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward, toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. Do you ever go down in a cave and they shut the lights off? I mean, it's, it's weird down there. Verse 22, And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Hmm. Boy, there's so many messages that you could use just from these few scriptures here. It's amazing. Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 through 30 says, 
Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The world has darkness, the Jews receive the light. Very interesting. Revelation 16, verses 10 and 11 says, And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Isn't it? I mean, as I was doing this study, it was just like, this is so amazing. It's just repeating. The events of the book of Exodus, it's going to happen again. It's the coming Exodus. It's going to happen twice. So many of the things line up. Okay, we're just going to hit a few more points here and then we're done. Uh, Exodus chapter 12, verse 21. And this is the important part of what happened in the book of Exodus. This is the one that you want to get more than anything. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. God himself will provide a lamb for the sacrifice. Verse 22, And ye shall touch, take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go, shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. The spiritual applications are just so numerous here. I, I can't get into everything. But, you know, you have the right side, left side, and the top that are struck. Kind of like a cross. And it's the door. Jesus said, I'm the door. And it's the blood. The blood of the perfect Lamb of God that takes away sins. Just amazing, the application there. Verse 23. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel... And on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. Excuse me. Verse 24, And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass when ye be come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep this service. That's why they still keep the Passover ceremony today. Verse 26, And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses, and the people bowed the head and worshipped. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So did they. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne upon the first, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, and he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, for there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Okay, and you're going to see a lot of that. I mean, one of the judgments of God in the tribulation time period is a third of all men are killed. That's a lot of people. <laughs> A lot of people. Okay? Very interesting. And this thing of Passover. We're going to talk about that, and that's where we're going to end the study this morning. Go back to your New Testament. Luke chapter 17. Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 17. Luke 17, verse 34. Here you have Jesus uh, explaining to the Jews um, about the thing of Him coming back, the second advent. It says here, I tell you in that night, it's also very interesting, we're not going to go over it here, I just want to mention it quick. If you look at verse 30 and verse 31, it says in that day. And then it says in that night. Now, that's not a contradiction. That's just showing you that the Bible is scientific. It can be day and night at the same time. Verse 34, I tell you in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. 
the one shall be taken and the other left. Now you'll see that in Matthew 24, Mark 13, you'll see that thing there time and time again. One's taken, one's left. And a lot of people say, well, that's the rapture. That's the pre-tribulation rapture. Well, there's some application there, but it's not. Okay, look at verse 37. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? Where are they taken? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Now you say, where on earth is that? <clears throat> Turn over to chapter 21. Luke 21, verse 20. Now remember the children of Israel had to flee Egypt back in the first exodus. And in the tribulation time period, Jerusalem is called spiritually Sodom and Egypt. Now are they going to have to flee? Yes, they will. Uh, Luke 21, verse 20. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Okay, the Jews have to flee Jerusalem when they see the Antichrist massing his armies. Uh, verse, Jump down to verse 25. It says here, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the, earth, and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. We'll continue here, and I'm going to tie all this stuff together then. Revelation chapter 12. Two more places to go to here. Revelation chapter 12. I know there's been a lot of scripture here, but uh, there's a lot of things to cover. Revelation chapter 12, verse 13. Revelation chapter 12, by the way, I'll say this. There's a woman that appears there in the first uh, verse. It's not Mary, the Queen of Heaven. It's a picture of Israel. And then there's war in heaven and Satan gets kicked out. So that's where we're picking it up here in verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child, Israel, in other words. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood and the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, we didn't cover this story there. You can read about it in Exodus. But after Pharaoh finally let the children of Israel go, they came to the Red Sea and God parted the Red Sea. He caused the water to abate, and they walked through on dry ground. Kind of interesting there, because it's sort of similar there. There's a flood, and God opens the, the ground, and it's, it becomes dry ground there, and they can, you know, escape. Very interesting. And, you know, some people say, well, the flood might be, you know, an army or something, too. I'm not going to get into that this morning. But Revelation chapter 19, this is where we're going to end it. Now, if you remember what it said there in Luke chapter 17, where are these people taken? Where are they taken? The one taken, the one left. Where are they taken? And he said, where the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Look at this. Revelation 19, verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. 
And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So I believe that these Jews, at the very end, are fleeing from this great army, and the great army is, they're being told they're going out to destroy these few Jews that are left. But in reality, they're going out, you know, the Antichrist, I think, is, is going to know that they're going out to make war against Jesus Christ and against his army, which is really kind of stupid. But they go out, and they're slaughtered. And Jesus doesn't take prisoners of war, by the way. <laughs> he doesn't take hostages or say, okay, now, you know, why? Well, because this army, they're probably all chipped, or whatever the mark of the beast will be, you know. They all have it. So when they take that mark of the beast, when they worship the beast, that's it. There's no second chance. So the Lord is perfectly justified just totally slaughtering these people. And it's interesting because I think the Jews are going to be there. It's going to be dark. It's going to be, what are we going to do? They're going to see, hear, they'll hear the army coming. Oh, what? Boy, I guess all hope is gone. And all of a sudden, look up. The redemption draweth nigh. Here comes Jesus and his army. They pass over them and go down and wipe out the Antichrist army. Very interesting stuff. Um, now let me just say this. In conclusion here, we are not in this time yet. And this time has not happened in the past. Okay, the, the Roman Catholic interpretation of amillennialism teaches that all the events of the book of Revelation happened in the past or that it was poetic or some foolish nonsense. We're not there yet. Okay, this hasn't happened yet. And there are also even professing Christians now that are saying that the time of Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation, they're saying it's really not going to be that bad. Well, that's a lie. And they're saying that because they believe Christians are going to go through it, which is also a lie. Now, this army that Jesus brings with him, Jesus is still taking recruits. <laughs> We're still in the church age. We're getting close to it being finished, but you can still get saved. If you're listening to this message, you can still be saved. And uh, don't be tempted to spend one more night with the frogs. Okay, Get saved now. There's nothing in this world that is worth you missing the rapture and having to possibly be one of the recruits in the Antichrist army that comes there and is slaughtered. And you end up as bird food, you know. I mean, not a good idea. Get saved today. Um, and, of course, you know, salvation. I mean, now's the day of salvation. I mean, first, you know, I'll just go over it real quickly. You can watch our video on, on salvation. You can contact us. But salvation is, is a simple thing. Understand that you're a sinner. There's really nobody that can, that can say that they're not a sinner. Okay? Don't be self-righteous. You're not good enough to get to heaven. You're a sinner. You can't save yourself. You need a Savior. And it's not Muhammad or Buddha or anybody else. It's Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. You need to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ now. You say, well, maybe later I'll think about it. That's a dumb decision. Because when this army, when the army of the Lord leaves, when the body of Christ is completed, you're going to have a very tough time getting saved. And if you're too big of a coward to get saved now when it's easy... Getting saved in the tribulation is going to be almost impossible because you're going to be martyred more than likely. Okay, and then, of course, if you do decide to get saved, you need to live for Jesus. And that's it. And if you need to know more about that, please contact us. Don't, don't do this thing of, well, I'm not ready. I just, there's some things I need to get covered first and, you know, some things I need. You can see the events coming to pass. You can see this thing building up. Okay, the thought of, of water being turned to blood and lots and lots of fish dying and everything, that would have seemed strange in the past. It's no longer strange. It's all through the news. There are millions and millions and millions of fish dying. There are earthquakes. There, there are wars and rumors of wars. We've been over this in other studies, but these events are coming, and you don't want to miss the rapture. So that's it for this morning.
And like I said, if you have any questions, please get in contact with us. With us. Thank you for listening.